All right, thanks for joining us in this session. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the Praxis exam and the wonderful course that's been developed by uh, Alan Jameson. And for those of you that don't know Alan, um, let me just share a little bit about him. Uh, uh, Alan is currently the chair of the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science and Associate Professor for Computer Science at St. Mary's College in Maryland. And along with his work in computer science education, he does research work in algorithmic graph theory. He is one of the reviewers for NCWIT's Aspirations in Computing Awards, very prestigious awards, including part of the External Review Committee for the Collegiate Award. And he's been doing this um, review course for computer science and helping out with MCCE and doing a phenomenal job. I can say that because I've taken the course, haven't taken the test yet though. <laughs> but I'm going to turn it over to Alan <laughs> and he's going to tell us a little bit about that. Okay. And let me make sure. Uh, yeah, we're good, Alan. Go ahead. All right. Thank you very much, Renee. Uh, as Renee said, I'm Alan Jameson, I'm currently at St. Mary's College of Maryland. Uh, unfortunately, uh, well, bittersweet, uh, not for too much longer. Um, uh, we're moving out of the Maryland area. Uh, we'll be working for Northeastern on one of their projects up in Maine. Um, so we're excited, but also sad to be leaving um, all of you all. Um, but uh, I do want to talk uh, about the Praxis stuff and the stuff that uh, we're still working on and will continue to work on for a while. Uh, if you uh, look on the screen, uh, there's uh, a Pear Deck join code. Uh, we don't have a lot of people in the, uh, in the group, so I don't know that it's going to be too much nece too, too necessary here. I just have this so that uh, we can do some interactive elements, some little quiz elements that go on. Uh, as we sort of proceed through the material. Um, so you can join or you can not join. Uh, that is absolutely fine. Uh, we'll just keep going with that. Um, so this, this session is about uh, the CS Praxis Prep stuff that is currently available through MCCE as long, along with some other materials. Uh, a lot of this work is, is developed across uh, a bunch of different uh, groups at MCCE. Um, Nick Yates uh, has been involved with this, a few others, um, in, including myself and uh, Dr. Lindsay Jameson, uh, who also works with me at the college. Uh, but basically, this session is going to be talking about sort of a general overview about the praxis. Um, how do we sort of approach those topics? Uh, and again, giving you some resources to uh, look at and uh, possibly uh, prepare yourself for the Praxis exam. Uh, the very first thing that I want to talk about, though, is sort of a big picture. And I, uh, this, is a, uh, th this is a slide that Diane prepared for, for this. Uh, it's a little bit hard to, to see because it's very, it's kind of all over the place. Uh, but it shows the various different ways that you can approach CS certification uh, in Maryland, um, not only through sort of a traditional uh, get your bachelor's degree in computer science and then uh, do the professional development to become a teacher, uh, but also going through it from the education side, which is actually the thing that we're going to be talking about uh, the most. The the two notes at the bottom are probably the most important things uh, to take away from the slide. Um, the first one is sort of the how, how you can get that secondary CS certification or add an endorsement. Um, for in-service teachers, 30 credits, pass an exam for existing teachers, um, or on the pre-service side, go to an approved program and pass uh, the Praxis exam for CS. Uh, the second one is the possibly the surprising note uh, approximately 400 to 500 teachers in CS uh, in Maryland, uh, fewer, of two, fewer than 200 of them are certified in CS. So less than half uh, actually carry the, the, the certification. 
Uh, and we do have teachers that span from uh, the elementary school all the way through the high school. Uh, but many, many, many of them don't actually carry uh, the official certification or endorsement. The Praxis exam itself is uh, really built into five parts. Um, the two biggest parts are programming and algorithm, uh, algorithmic and uh, computational thinking. Uh, this is the, the, in all honesty, this is the area where uh, people struggle the most with the, the exam. This is the thing that people classically think of as computer science, uh, but there are lots and lots of different, uh, different areas that comprise computer science, but the praxis really works on that very specific domain knowledge in sort of the coding aspect of it. It also includes some stuff about data, data processing, um, that, that area, including storage, uh, some stuff about computer systems and networks, which includes security, uh, and then impacts of computing, which also includes ethics and, and ethical standards. Uh, one big part of this is to note that CS content, that programming content, is really only part of the picture to be an, an excellent computer science teacher. Uh, many of you are already doing a lot of these things uh, in your classrooms, and I want to highlight the fact that those are the things that traditionally end up being uh, most important beyond the domain knowledge, right? There, there is, you still have to have some of that domain knowledge, but the idea of doing some lifelong learning, advocacy for, for, for equity in, in computer science and in your classroom, uh, doing sort of the design and looking at uh, the, the, the cutting edge, effective pedagogy. Uh, those are the things that are really going to make uh, a, a computer science teacher a great computer science teacher. Uh, that those are the, the aspects of it. The other thing to think about as you are possibly thinking about doing uh, computer science stuff with your, your schools or your school districts is to also consider how computer science and computational thinking folds into other areas uh, like art, history, and maybe traditional areas like mathematics, science, uh, and think about how those sort of skills, including decomposition and uh, the critical thinking, problem solving skills that are involved with computational thinking can be folded into already existing standards for these other content areas. And so for instance, um, I have a little, uh, little exercise for you. Um, and this, is, this, would, this is, comes from the CS Unplugged group, uh, which has a fantastic uh, bunch of resources. Uh, but this is a exercise that you could do a little paint by numbers type exercise uh, with uh, early elementary students. What the, uh, the idea here is that if you see a zero, you're going to, to color it in black or red or blue or green, whatever, whatever color that you want to use, but you're going to do it in some consistent, uh, use some consistent coloring. And so what I want you to do is to, to, to look at this, um, possibly sketch it out yourself uh, and tell me what, what image you actually see. And so I'll give, Folks, maybe maybe a minute or two uh, to do that. Alan, can you paste the link for this um, in the Here chat? It. I I can't find it in 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 the Google stuff or anything. Yeah, give me thanks. One moment. I want to put the 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 actual one in here. Oh, okay. Yeah. And this is going to come up with a, this isn't going to come up with a, uh, a digital doc. Uh, uh, well, it will come up with a digital document, but it won't come up with an exercise that folks can do just sort of straight up. Um, it'll do, uh, it, it's a nice thing that provides a lot of principles um, where you can vary the numbers that you, you need to deal with and also the images. Um, and so it'll generate a, a PDF uh, and uh, you can go from there. Um, the, 
uh, join code, if you want to do this through Pear Deck, um, is uh, right up at the top. If you just go to join PD and then uh, this particular join code. Um, and you can actually draw directly on the slide if you're doing, doing the Pear Deck stuff. While this is going on, uh, so this is paint by numbers. Uh, pretty much everybody, I think everybody has this, this experience somewhere in their life at some point. Um, some folks uh, like myself have to reach far, far back in their, their history to remember when uh, we did paint by numbers. Um, and you wouldn't necessarily think that this is uh, computational thinking in any way that this doesn't really tie into computer science but the big thing for here is that what are we asking the students you know maybe a first grader uh to do here and the idea is that they are trying to do pattern recognition um, on both not only identifying the numbers that are there applying the appropriate tool to that number but also looking at the image once it's done and uh telling us what that image is and this, believe it or not, is part of the computational thinking skills. And this is part, this could be incorporated into uh, an art lesson uh, very, very easily uh, for those sort of kindergarten, first grade, second grade, uh, maybe, maybe not the second grade stuff, but there are more difficult versions of this that could be uh, incorporated in. So I wanna just give a little bit more time before I just sort of spoil what the answer is. Because we do have a decent amount of stuff to cover. So I didn't think far enough ahead on this to actually have a reveal slide where it just shows the, the, the image. Um, but the, the image that is actually created here is the teacup. Um, and so let me drop this here. Um, and it's actually cut off. It's cut off at uh, the, the, just the, the cup part on here because it couldn't fit the whole thing on the, on the slide. Um, but again, this is the, the, the pixel painter uh, Thing, and it goes, the two possible binary values is the simplest version of these, uh, but you can go all the way up to uh, eight possible binary values. And then you're really starting to, to look at some, some computational thinking stuff in that case. And it's a little more difficult for maybe some of your more advanced students. All right. If there, if, if questions uh, show up, uh, by all means, just uh, drop it into chat or interrupt me. I don't mind. So let's talk about the vocabulary of CS. Um, and this is one of the things that we've realized over time is actually kind of a, a, a big thing, a big problem uh, for, for folks who are coming at learning computer science education, learning to be a computer science teacher, uh, but don't have that background in computer science. They, maybe didn't take a computer science class uh, while they were in college or didn't have exposure to it while they were in high school. Uh, and they, they just don't, the, the, the knowledge of the terminology seems to be this insurmountable barrier. Uh, and so we're, what we're trying to do with some of, the, some of the materials is actually to demystify a lot of that, to try to make it a little bit easier for our teachers to learn this material and not have as big of an issue getting into what we think of as sort of the core ideas of computer science uh, and make sure that that roadblock of just the terminology kind of goes away. And so we've got a write up here about sort of the general idea of, of computer science. We talk about programs and how they operate and that they operate in this thing called binary code 
which is just ones and zeros that a computer understands. A compiler, what a, what a compiler is, what an interpreter is. Uh, but the thing that I want to really highlight is this last paragraph here. It says, when programmers plan programs, they often write out their plan, also called an algorithm, in pseudocode, uh, which is a somewhat precise way of describing the actual code to write without needing all the details. Uh, and this is close to real code, um, but it basically allows us to transfer an idea of an algorithm to actual code. And we, when we talk about an algorithm, what we really want here is sort of the step-by-step -step process. And I like to tell my students, uh, my, my college level students, that computers are inherently stupid. Um, they only understand very small, very precise instructions, and they will only do what you tell them to do. I have students who claim that this is not true, but, unfor but unfortunately for them, it is true. That it only does what they ask you, what you ask that computer to do. Uh, but this means that those algorithms that you're creating can't be too abstract, can't be too broad. We do these exercises with intro students where we ask them to come up with the algorithm for something as simple as tying your shoes or making breakfast or, uh, or, or drawing a circle. Uh, one of the, my favorite activities that we do physically in the classroom, which we haven't been able to do for a little while, is to have uh, a teaching assistant or a, another representative of the class start on the whiteboard with a whiteboard marker and have the, the, the students in the class give the instructions to draw some figure. It could be a stick figure, could be a circle, could be a square, could be a rectangle, and to see that process happen live. And so that the students really understand what goes into the thinking behind building an algorithm and realizing that yes, it does have to be simple and yes, it does have to be precise. And so when we talk about algorithms and pseudocode, that's the kind of simplicity that we're looking for. And this is really important because the majority of the exam, of the praxis exam, is going to be on these ideas. Uh, this is also going to be the area that's going to be unfamiliar to folks who've never seen computer science before. And it's going to be the, the thing that we have spent a lot of time on in sort of the preparatory materials. Uh, in addition, there's some things like cybersecurity, uh, network systems concepts uh, that are also going to be unfamiliar for folks who aren't, who don't have experience couched in computer science. There's areas um, about data and impacts to society and ethics. Those require less specific knowledge and are less intimidating for, for, for folks who are looking at the exam materials because a lot of them are just common sense, right? What do you do in these scenarios? Speaking of pseudocode, this is the sort of thing that we might look at as far as the pseudocode goes. And so on the, on the left side here, we have kind of the English, what we would say in English, right? Your score is 10, um, your health is 10, your score is increased by five, your health is decreased by three. So something for a video game or something like that. Um, and then the pseudocode, and this is actually the Praxis pseudocode that we're using over on the right, um, shows how we would change that English statement into that pseudocode statement. So I've got that arrow, and that basically says, if I'm looking at score arrow 10, that that 10 is being placed into a, a container, a holder, uh, that we call a variable, and that variable is named score. And so all a variable is in this particular case is just this, this container that I'm holding some data in. We also have the idea, if you look at score arrow score plus five, where we're doing kind of multiple expressions at the same time, multiple operations. The important thing is that we do the stuff on the right-hand side, the stuff before the, after the assignment, before we actually do the assignment itself. And so we would increase score by five and then set that back into that variable. The pseudocode uh, stuff that is built into to the Praxis exam is fairly straightforward. Um, 
it, it follows kind of general, the general conventions for a lot of programming languages. Um, it's just about really interpreting the symbols. And so we have your common arithmetic operators, plus, minus, divide, multiply. Uh, but you have two arithmetic operators that you may not be familiar with. Uh, that little caret symbol there represents power. Um, and then the little uh, percent signs here represent something called modulus. These are commonly used items that uh, are in programming. And so we have specific representations here. We also have relational operators. Uh, these are your inequalities like less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. But we have two special ones. Those double equals just ask the question, is the left side equal to the right side? Um, if it is, then we say yes or true. If it isn't, then we say no or false. Um, and then we've got the equal that's got the slash through it. That's going to be not equal. And we've got other things that are built into this. Uh, and this is the, the thing that folks uh, will, will sometimes stumble with because it's a lot of information that you kind of have to retain as you are going through the exam because the exam will have these in it. Uh, things like these logical operators, and, or, and not. There's a re reasonable chance that someone taking this exam does, hasn't, hasn't really seen that stuff before, before their actual prep, right? Before, before studying for the exam. And these represent statements where I've got two, two things that are asking a question, right? So if I've got something and something else, what I want is the, both sides to be true. So let's say that I've got I is less than five and J is less than four. As long as I and J match those patterns, match those inequalities, then we're good. And just represents that both sides of that, uh, that, that operation are true. If it's or, all I need is one side or the other. And then not, it's just negating something. So if something is true, if I do, do that not operation, it's going to flip it to false. And so these are the things that you kind of have to think about, the things that you have to worry about as part of uh, the pseudocode stuff. And this note down here at the bottom is, is really, really important, something that we've been working on uh, for, for quite some time, is how are our pre-service students supposed to understand this if they have never done any computer science? If, they, if we've got a student that's in an MAT program who didn't take a computer science co uh, uh, course while they were in their undergraduate and they didn't take one in high school, how, do they, how, do, how can they understand this? And part of it is us trying to, to, to help that uh, process along. So as part of this, this effort, uh, we have some new additions to the MCCE Praxis Prep uh, Google Classrooms, which we, we link at the end of the, uh, of the presentation. Um, and this is designed to help course takers to understand bigger picture stuff. It talks about um, what, why do programmers care? Uh, what are, you know, why do we do these things? Uh, what, what, are the vo what are the vocabulary words and what do they mean in like plain English? So we've got something called scope when we're talking about global and local variables. What does that mean? What, it, it just means where is that, where can I use that variable? And so we try to demystify that stuff as well as giving you some other online resources so that no matter what kind of, what kind of resource you need, hopefully we've provided it maybe in multiple different ways. And so we pull from, from external stuff as well, you know, YouTube videos, uh, websites, blog posts, uh, stuff that we think may be useful for, for understanding. And a lot of times these are couched specifically in a language like Python or Java uh, that, you know, where you can see the application and maybe that application um, actually ends up being a, a better thing for you. Uh, this, this is a uh, kind of a pun uh, slide. Coding requires logic. Um, the relational operators are ones that work off of the Boolean values, uh, also known as just true, false. And so these are all logical operations, right? A equals B, A doesn't equal B, 
A is less than B, A is greater than B. And so if we, if we look at those, those are using variables, those little containers of, of values. Over on the right, here are some examples, right? Four equals five is false. Four less than or equal to five is true. Four less than five is true, uh, so on and so forth. And so uh, real quick, um, it's your turn. Um, and so I've got two values here, X and Y, uh, two variables. X is set to 10, Y is set to five. So my question is uh, just which of these following statements are true? And you can put your answer into chat, or if you joined us on the Pear Deck, you can put it in there. Carla says number one. Question is, is 10 greater than five? Absolutely, All right? And so this would return true when we're looking at it from uh, the pseudocode example. Is there any of these other ones that are true? So we also have two other ones out of this list that are true. Uh, we have number three, uh, which has sort of a compound statement as part of it. Uh, y greater than y minus one. So basically it's asking five, is five greater than four? So five minus one is four. So that will end up being true as well. But also number four, is y less than or equal to x? It is. And then I've got that and statement. So I need to look at the other side of it. So is x greater than or equal to nine? It is. So is 10 greater than or equal to nine? And so what I've got here is a true and a true. And that and statement there says, I need to have both sides of my statement to be true for the whole thing to be true. So one, three, and four are all true. Again, as we're going through this, if you have any questions or anything like that, please feel free to stop me. Uh, there are places to practice this, this stuff and also basically everything that you would see in sort of the AP classroom. Uh, Khan Academy is one place that um, has a really great resource for, for a lot of this stuff. And uh, if you have access to the slides, uh, which you should, um, then you, you absolutely should be able to, to click on this link and go to some of that stuff. Uh, another question here uh, is, this is more classically what we see out of the, uh, out of the, the Praxis exam. And so this is a question that is directly out of the Praxis uh, study guide. And this is the kind of format that you would actually see. And so as you're preparing for them or you're helping others uh, prepare for it, you need to see all of this stuff. And especially over on the left side here where it's got that pseudocode. So it says, consider the following pseudocode segment with integer values. Integer just means whole numbers in this case. 
uh, which is intended to determine the largest value among variables A, B, and C, and to store that value in variable max. The code segment does not work as intended. And so the question here, uh, and again, this is one on the more advanced side, is which test case, when you apply it, will show that it doesn't work? And uh, I'll give folks a little bit of time to see if you can you can figure out which one of these, A, B, C, or D, um, actually ends up not working. Any thoughts? So the answer here is C. And we can trace through this to see how that works. So if I've got A is equal to 20, B is equal to 25, and C is equal to 25. First, we don't have one single max, right? So we'll take either C or B as being our maximum value here. I've got an if statement here, which means that I've got an if and then some uh, one of these relational operations here, right? A greater than B. If it happens to be true, then what we do is just do the stuff that's right underneath it, uh, that's indented a little bit so that if A happens to be greater than B, then I go into the if statement that says A greater than C. If it's not true, then I drop into the else statement, which then goes into if B is greater than C. So if A is A greater than B, no. So I drop into the else and then ask, is B greater than C? Which isn't true either. And so what's the, what's the answer here? We get C as the max, but I've got that, that issue where I end up with something that um, is, it's ambiguous, right? Like, is, is it B, is it C, which one is it? Uh, so let's talk about algorithms. Algorithmic topics for, and really we're just talking general topics of the uh, actual uh, the, the actual praxis exam here. Using abstraction and decomposition, number conversion, and specifically there's a question over here on the right side, which is the larger quantity? 10101111, uh, which is a binary uh, string based or what those two values actually are. Trace and analyze those algorithms, right? Just like we just did with that one exercise. 
What are the limitations of computing? What is or isn't solvable? Doing some basic algorithms about searching and sorting. Looking at recursion, where a procedure calls itself. And then randomization. How do I generate random numbers? What do I do with that information? Data, again, is one of those five big concepts. What's, what's part of that? Things like digitization, where I'm going to be actually creating new digital documents. What's appropriate? What's not appropriate? What formats do I use? What's encryption and decryption? What's the size of data? And in particular cases, what are, uh, what are my, my questions that I could be asking here? For data, data digitization, um, this is really about the format of the data, right? Where, where am I going from, you know, like printed, printed paper, um, and then what is that represented as sort of the digital space, right? So going from like sounds to audio files, like MP3s, printed material to Word documents, text documents, PDFs, uh, things like that. Uh, but the general concepts are the same. I need to convert those items into bits, and those bits are things that the computer can then understand, interpret, and show on my screen. When we're talking hey, about Alan. yeah, oh, back on the on the digitization stuff, like yes, sir. on the on the praxis itself, these are the quite like you could get quite detailed on this, right? Going into sampling size and quantification and so on and so forth. How detailed on the praxis do they get for these students? Like my. My CS students that I, I have two of them getting ready to go into an MAT, uh, secondary MAT, which is great. They'll be able to handle that. But what about somebody who is a certified elementary school teacher and needs to, to understand the process of digitization? They actually have to go into, you know, demonstrating the understanding quantification of the samples or anything like that? Or is it just a general conceptual understanding? Um, it's general conceptual stuff. Um, there is some things, uh, we'll talk about size here, here in a couple of, uh, of a couple of moments. So the general understanding of like, yeah, a text document is smaller than an audio file and an audio file is smaller than a video file. And then like, what are the, what are the kind of the, the, the grand levels, the broad levels of those, uh, of that, that kind of quantification. Okay. Um, they don't need there, there, I guess there could be questions about compression, um, with, with this stuff. Um, but it's generally, it's generally about sort of, it's generally common sense stuff yeah. is what I would say. So even when you get into compression, they're not going to go into like demonstrate a run length, you know, algorithm or anything like that. They're just going to say, um, if you have a document, or I'm sorry, let's do something bigger, a JPEG um, that has a 10 to 1 compression ratio, and how much smaller is this file? Right. Um, something like that. Something like that. Okay, uh, cool. Yeah. In, in, I've, always, in, I've always wondered that. Yeah. In my experience, most of these questions are about how you use something, right? Like mm -hmm. what's the appropriate thing to use right. rather than the sort of the nitty gritty details, the, the, the stuff, the algorithmic stuff that goes into it. Okay. That's, that's kind of good. Yep. Um, and for instance, like encryption and decryption, it's mostly about the, that broad understanding of like, what does encryption mean? Why do we use it? What does decryption mean? Why do we use it? They're not asking, uh, those teachers, the, the, the soon to be teachers to, you know, go through and compute how, uh, how how some encryption protocol would actually encrypt a piece of data. Um, and so like there's stuff in that regard. It's mostly about why we use it, how we use it, and what do those words actually mean? So do, and, do they try to trick them? Um, because you know when you first get into this and forgive me if uh, this would be the last like technical question i have i <laughs> promise because i realize that there's a lot of people in there like what i hope not 
Um, <laughs> but like, you know, there's a lot of confusion of the difference between a hash and, and uh, you know, and, and an encryption algorithm, right? And, you know, ciphertext, right? Um, do they try to trick them? I mean, the hashes are used in that, but hashes and, and you know, ciphertext are completely different. So do they ever like try to trick them or anything like that? Are there any, any things like that? It's not been my experience that they're they're giving purposefully tricky questions like maybe you and I would give an undergraduate student. That I give to um, a computer science student. Right. And I, sorry, yeah. I, I should yeah. make that, 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 yeah. that very specifically clear. Yeah. Um, you know, the, they are, they're not trying to, to trick, trick students. Okay. Um, I, in all of the material that I've seen, I haven't seen anything where they're particularly being devious with the question. Or the okay. Question. Good. Okay. I promise that's the last technical question because okay. that, that just kind of <laughs> eases my mind in general. The, the first people I have to help with this are computer scientists. So that's, I'm, I'm not worried about them. What I'm worried about are the, the people that come to me in elementary and high school and maybe they don't have a science background at all and they want to study for this, you know. So yeah. thank you very much. I will stop with any technical questions now. Okay. Um, one of the things, and we just sort of hinted at it, um, is that there are questions about the size of data and what are things that are going to be appropriate for, 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 certain, um, for certain applications. And so just on this uh, slide, I'm not going to take too much time to talk about it. Um, it's just sort of the general blow by blow. These are the sizes that you're looking at. And over on the right hand side, the example of the file types um, that could be measured in this and including all the way up to exabyte um, and like why, why we even have a word for, for that much data. Uh, it's general concept stuff, but there are some things where we may ask a, an application question like this one. So consider the following assumptions about electronic storage for the text in all books of a university libraries. And it's, uh, it's some numbers here, and it's really a question of multiplication. Um, I, I'm, we're running a little bit uh, short on time, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but like, you're going to do this multiplication, right? Start with 3 million books, multiply by 400 pages, multiply by 50 lines, multiply by 10 words, multiply by five letters, and then you get roughly what the size is going to be. And then it just asks you, okay, which one of these four, megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte, or petabyte, would be actually appropriate for this? Networks and security. This is another one of the areas where we anticipate that teachers that are coming at this from the education perspective rather than the computer science perspective might have some stumbling blocks. Uh, and so we have things like networks and security. We want uh, students to, to know the components of networks, right? What are, what, what's a router? What's, uh, what's a modem? What, why are they different? And sometimes they're combined when you're looking at your home networks, uh, uh, at you know your Wi-Fi network in your home, but they, uh, on sort of an industrial level, they aren't necessarily in the same thing. And fra frankly, it would be surprising if they were. What are the differences there? Be familiar with the factors that have an impact on network functionality. What do I mean by network functionality? Right? That's going to be speed. How much? data I can, I, I can transmit either direction, upload or download. These, ter these terms here, those are the things that, we, that, that students can sometimes struggle with. And so we wanna make sure that when we're talking about them, that they have that broad, uh, broad experience with it. Over on the right-hand side here, we've got things about topology, right? Like how a network is oriented, right? We've got a, a ring, uh, a network bus, star, Th what are those things? Why do we use them? We also want uh, folks who are going to be taking the praxis to understand what digital and physical strategies we might use to maintain security and be familiar with the general concepts of security. 
like what is a denial of service attack? Why do we, why, why is it something that shows up in the news all the time? Why is it that when I wanna use Netflix, there's always a denial of service attack? What is going on with those sort of things? And also to be familiar with the components that make up what we normally use from, from the internet, right? What we use for the web, right? And that includes things like HTTP, what, what does that mean? What is that protocol? Why do, what are the protocols that drive content on the internet? What's HTML? It's a programming language. What programming language? What do we use it for? How is it used? So what are servers? What are clients? Things of that nature. So for example here, um, which of the following best describes the primary way in which a distributed denial of service attack differs from a denial of service attack? And so the difference here is very subtle. It's that word distributed here. And what we want the students to have out of a, approaching a praxis question like this is understanding that that distributed word is the key here. And that distributed word means that I have a different number of computers launching the attack. Denial of service attack, typically one, one network node, one computer, one server, but a distributed attack means that I've got many servers. And sometimes in, in certain cases, global uh, number of servers. So um, I wanna give about 10 minutes for any questions, comments, concerns, um, but one of the things that uh, we want to highlight is that MCCE is always looking to collaborate for additional resources beyond uh, the classroom stuff that we've set up. There are links here. I'm going to put those links into chat uh, here in a moment. Um, we're looking for ways of doing micro-credentials. Um, if you are at all interested in any of that stuff um, and interested in collaborating on it, uh, mcce at usmd.edu. I believe that's the right. I believe that's the right email. I hope it's the right email. Otherwise, somebody else is getting some interesting emails. Um, send an email to that e email address, um, and uh, Diane or one of uh, one of the folks within MCCE uh, will be happy to reach out to you and start talking about what's next. Uh, and with that, thank you all very much for attending the session. Uh, I will take any questions that you have at this stage. I know we've got a tight deadline between um, the, the two different uh, the two different sessions that are happening this late after, late yeah. morning. We have a few minutes left. I haven't stopped recording. So if you have any questions for Alan, you can either put them in the chat or just unmute and we'll let Alan respond to those. Hey, Alan, have you been, have you taught this to in-service teachers? Um, we have taught it in a, in a pilot program yeah. um, that are not to in-service teachers though. I, I just realized you asked for in-service. We haven't tried this with in-service yet. Um, it was it was going to be the next step. So so you did it um, pre-service then. Yeah. And then was was that uh, elementary or was it secondary? It was secondary. Uh, and then um, how how'd they do? Like, I, you know, how many did you have? What was the success rate and stuff like that? Um, we had uh, around ten students, um, and I don't know what the success rate is because we ran it last spring. Mm -hmm. Of course, last spring, of course, everything went to, yeah, and, and we haven't followed up to see how many, in all honesty, we don't know how many of them actually attempted the praxis, yeah. um, other than, rather than they wanted to have that basis of knowledge. What, what does your gut tell you? How do you think they would have done? I mean, you know, after you spend a lot of time with them, you probably have a, a rough idea. Yeah, we have we had a lot of students who had some CS background. Um, yeah. So there, uh, my my feeling is that the the success rate was going to be pretty high. Okay. All right. 
right, how do you think, and I'm curious of everybody else, how do you think it will go for in-service teachers? I find in-service teachers, their plates are so full. This is to remove the pandemic out of this, right? Yeah. Their plates were already so full before this. And anybody else chime in? I'm curious. Do you think if we did, because that's been the discussion up here, right? Um, is we definitely need more people, especially in the elementary school space, um, and uh, and definitely in um, you know throughout, right? Um, if we offered a, a, a PD session and we got funding for it, paid, and it was exclusively for in-service teachers, how, you know, what is everybody's feeling of how many? people would show up you know do, do you think that is let's say not this summer but next summer right do you think how many people we think do you think it would be worthy for them they, they got paid uh, to do it and everything none <laughs> <laughs> i i think that we we'd have takers um it really like for for you and i because we're we're kind of on the edges of Maryland, um, right. it might be a little bit tougher for us to to uh, get folks down to to St. Mary's or to Frostburg or wherever. Mm -hmm. um, but for folks that like Hood, um, I think they they might have quite a few takers. The honestly, the uh, Google Classroom stuff that MCCE ha has built, I think might be the best case sort of type. PD, right? Mm -hmm. I know that uh, Deborah and Nick are doing uh, a weekend Saturday, uh, multiple weeks in a row workshop um, to to get teachers, um, uh, teach in service teachers ready for for the praxis. I don't know what their enrollment is though. Yeah. Hmm. Young, didn't you guys do this on Hood several years back? Did you do something on Hood? Um, I we we attended something. Well, I, th I thought uh, Jong uh, Jong's on here, right? Young Lee from Hood. Didn't you guys do something on Hood a couple of years back? Maybe three years back, two years back. Maybe he's not actually here. <laughs> All right, Carla, yeah, um, what's your? Yeah, go yeah. ahead. There were some workshops at Hood College, but I don't remember if uh, Prep for the Praxis was one of them. But yeah, there were several workshops uh, in the summer at Hood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm here. <laughs> it's okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. yep. So yes, we did offer a several sequence of workshop, but that was not the purpose, the initial purpose was not intended to prepare our audiences, which is uh, pre-service uh, teachers uh, for the practice. But uh, uh, we have this goal, uh, we kind of have this, uh, in order to keep the sustainability, in order to reuse some of the materials that we created, we also want to have this, uh, um, some of our students to try to get them get the CS certificate. That's why I'm here. I want to learn yeah. the material. So, yeah. Hey, Carla, how do you think it would go if we offered some kind of a session, um, you know, for like your kids uh, up there in Garrett County? It, like, I know they're not ready to take the praxis at that point, right? But, right, right. you know, it, a pre preparing them for that transition into the, the university to finish their bachelor's. Would that be a neat connection is start getting them and getting them think, like we did that once, but being yeah. more proactive and getting them to start thinking about the computer science practice at the community college level, their second year, you know, before they graduate. What do you think about that idea? I, I think it should be done. Definitely. I think more and more of it need, needs to be done. So, yeah. Mm. That might be a neat idea. Yeah. Maybe we can talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds really good. All right, we're winding down. If there aren't any more questions, I'm going to stop the recording and